All right, here's today's trivia question. So today was a great uh, show, as usual. Of course, it's a good show. We always have good shows. But in the beginning of the episode, we talked about Batman. There's a new Batman that's coming out. And we talked about who was the best Batman of all time and who was the worst Batman of all time. So here's what we want to do with you. First off, we're going to give away a free workout program if you do this particular contest, this trivia question, right? So here's what you got to do. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours. Let us know who you thought did the best Batman, who did the worst Batman, and tell us why. Explain why. Also, subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. If we like your comment the most within that 24-hour period, we will send you free access to the No BS six-pack formula. This is a core training program designed to develop the abs and the obliques so that they're more visible even at higher body fat percentage. Is. Isn't that cool? I don't know why I said that word with a little phase there. Percentage, percentage age. Kind of weird. I can't talk right now. Anyhow, go check those out. Also, one more thing. The No BS Six Pack Formula and MAPS Anabolic are combined right now for a special bundle sale. You can get both for $59.99 if you head over to mapsoctober.com. All right? Here comes the show. You got a study for us, guy? How do you say it, Justin? I want Sarcoplasmic to... hypertrophy. It was. He's got the best nerd voice. Mm. Yes. Is this different than the I one you brought up the other day? Because you just brought up one. Just I didn't bring up a sarcoplasmic Weren't hypertrophy. we just talking about that? We did. We did. So No, I found a study from 2019. Kind of interesting. Well, they trained- That muscle I'm, fluid. No, I'm going to pull up the, the study. So they took uh, 30 trained young men. So these were not beginners. So these were guys that already worked out. Okay. And they put them on a high volume- kind of like pump-based workout, right? Kind of like a classic bodybuilder-type workout. Uh -huh. It was only six weeks, so it's a short study. And the title of the study says, Muscle Fiber Hypertrophy in Response to Six Weeks of High-Volume Resistance Training in Trained Young Men is Largely Attributed to Sarcoplasmic Hypertrophy. So the growth that they got in that six weeks of high volume, a lot of it, most of it, was sarcoplasmic uh, hypertrophy. But was it transient Opposed to what? Hypertrophy. Uh, like actual muscle fiber hypertrophy. Okay. So it was the the size that they got, the increased muscle volume. A lot of it was really that pump uh, kind of effect that they got. Not the not not the temporary pump, but rather the you know what builds up do over you, time. Do you think they measured them hmm. uh, flaccid or aired up? Flaccid. They do. Yeah, I don't even know if that's a word for muscle. I, can I pump. still use flaccid for that, Doug? I'm getting like uncomfortable. Limp, like you, limp muscle? You can do whatever you want, Adam. Well, I know I can. That flaccid I muscle do, is- But I'm, my point is, is it, is it correct? <laughs> versus erect <laughs> muscle. Limp yeah. arms. Yeah. 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 No, I, no, it, was, it, was, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't the transient aspect. So it was afterwards. Oh, okay. Yeah. And this is cool because, uh, I mean, some of the bro science out there is, you know, obviously, obviously bodybuilders train very differently from powerlifters. Mm -hmm. Both have a tremendous amount of muscle on their bodies. Bodybuilders obviously more muscle on their bodies, but less strength. So it just proves that you know th there is a val validity to to training that way, just like we knew already. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So fla the definition of flaccid. I can use it, Honda. Huh, of yeah, it looks pretty good. Let's yeah. see. It says soft and hanging loosely or <laughs> limply. Yeah, <laughs> especially so as to look or feel unpleasant. <laughs> it feels it totally, feels unpleasant. It totally it's works. Unpleasant. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of depressing. Yeah. Nobody likes that flat yeah, feeling. You know I don't saying? like this sweater. It feels <laughs> flaccid. <laughs> Take it off. It's unpleasant. But anyway, uh, the study is cool because it shows that there's a lot of validity to that. You know, increasing and what they did is they tested sarcoplasmic proteins and sarcoplasm in general. And saw that they had some like some muscle size, most most of the muscle size in that six week. Period now you're was bringing this up, but this doesn't. Uh, this is not different than what we were just discussing. Yeah. I mean, this is pretty much confirming what we said, anyways. Right? Exactly. It's just cool to see studies where they're testing it specifically and confirming. Yeah. Kind of, you know, what we've uh, all all observed ourselves. I wish there was a better way for me to explain what I what I talked about with you know the difference between strength training and low rep yeah. and how it how it seems to look different on the body it does it's more of a solid hard look when it's just pure strength like more and, then, dense. and then the bodybuilder look is more of that full, bubbly bubbly yeah absolutely yeah and it's funny because Squishy. that's the difference like if you've ever seen a power lifter that's muscular and a bodybuilder that's muscular you there is a bit of a difference to their to, to the way they look some of it being genetics but some of it's got to be 
Well, this is what's always funny. You get some of those videos where it's like a strength competition and everybody always like picks the guy that like is huge and is like the most ripped looking, you know, and that's not always the case. No, it's not. I mean, who's that boxer? That'd be a fun game to play. Actually, I wonder how well the three of us would do. If we like lined up like strength athletes and compete, and yeah, like we all they're all deadlifting, let's say a competition, and you had five different bodies, could we look and be able to predict the order they would? If I knew what their training was like well, leading into it, come on, that's not. I mean, well, I mean, based on their pure, body, yeah, dude. Period. just on how they look, yeah, yeah. boy, that that's hard. It is that can be really hard. I don't know. I feel like we well, could do pretty good. Deceptive. I know, but you know, have you ever been like completely shocked? I've been shocked. Of so course, many times. of course. I mean, uh, Mike Salemi is an example of that. I, I, it's so I mean, he looks like he looks athletic. Yeah. He's one of the strongest people I've ever met. Yeah, life. he's uh, he just looks like an athletic guy. Yeah, when he what he pulls over six hundred. He has pulled over six hundred. Yeah, at I a mean, body weight of one hundred and sixty or something. You know who else? Jordan Syatt's like that. Jordan Syatt's strong as hell. Yeah, I those know. those two guys are very unassuming. So I, I would definitely not win that if they were in the five and and because their body types just don't yeah. look like they I pull that I kind of the one person that was most like that that I've ever met in my entire life. I think I've talked about this girl. I trained this. She was a young gymnast. She was tiny. She was this little thing. And she was kind of built like a little gymnast, you know? But, I mean, this is not this is not no joke. I think she probably weighed 85 pounds. She was tiny, right? She could bench press the wheels, <laughs> the 45s. Oh, wow. Yeah. And she would do pull-ups like with her legs out in front of her like 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 this fast. Like it was like like I'm pretending to do pull-ups. That's how she did them. Did you see that article that Sean Baker uh, posted the other day about the average weight of a female today? No. Uh -oh. oh yeah, he posted. It looked like it was. I think the article is a year or two old, um, but it was the average female's weight today is the same as a man's was in 1965-ish. I think somewhere. It's not due to muscle, too, is it? Well, no, I, I don't, don't know. think so. I just it's thought terrible. that was interesting. Yeah, did you know that girl that uh, women used to get their periods later back then than they do today? Later, as in later in life. Oh, oh yeah, wow. yeah. It's been going younger. Oh, they've been talking about that for a long time. Yeah. Right? And they think it has to do with the, the, the hormones and food. Isn't that what? The, well, food and also more body fat. If a if a young girl has right. more body fat on her body, uh, she'll 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 become fertile or whatever earlier on. Um, although. They are now, there are big reports coming out on, what do they call phthalates? Am I saying that right, Doug? The Some of the chemicals right. you find in plastics yeah. and stuff. And they're like, oh, these definitely have hormone disrupting uh, you know, properties. And it's probably why sperm counts have been plummeting in men. Worldwide, by the way. In, mm -hmm. in modern society, in developed societies, sperm counts are going like this at a ridiculous uh, rate. Oh, there it crazy. is right there. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, there it is right there. Yeah, guys were small back in the 60s, weren't they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, pretty crazy stuff. I uh, wonder what it was back then, though, Doug. Maybe you can look up to see what. So back then, is, I mean, because it's not that big of a deal if it's like a five pound swing, right? Like it seems that seems drastic to me, but maybe it's not. Like, I don't know. Do you know? You know, no, I don't. But you know, what's even crazier is if you combine this with the the strength, uh, like the, t the strength tests, tests, excuse me, that they did in male college students in that in those decades versus now. So they were much smaller and lighter, yeah, but way stronger. Yeah, I remember you, you've shared this before. Their grip strength was like of like what a it, sixty-five year old yeah, back then. Yeah, oh, <laughs> well, it's just pretty crazy. Uh, now, although women's grip strength has not really changed much, it was it's men's that have gone down. Yeah, quite a bit. So I don't know. I got yeah. something crazy for you guys. Did you? I know I showed you. Okay, I'm pretty sure I showed you. I don't know if you saw it yet, and if you haven't, Doug, you got to pull it up so we can see it. Look up alter ego on Fox. Oh, you, did you look you, at I didn't it? Watch it yet? You gotta you watch it. Yet, dude. We so gotta play the, it. This is so, the thing you explain, right? Yeah. Where they we play it, Andrew. You'll have to pause this break right here, but I want Sal to actually see this because it's crazy. Okay. Yeah, this is. It's basically like a uh, an American Idol, uh, right? But it's an avatar that does the present. That does. The yeah, it's it's a. It looks like it's a hologram of them. Click on the trailer, yeah. Doug, if you uh, if you can find. Yeah, the trailer. so they project it out on the stage. It looks like that. Um, but they, they're all censored out with one of those suits that has like the tracking dots. So that way they can like have this rendered character. And they, they shared some of these clips behind scenes of these, these kids talking, right. And just how much they love this because they feel like they get all nervous when they're in front of other people and they have all this social anxiety mm -hmm. and they don't feel like people are judging them. And you know, this is how I predict that we're going to justify this. Oh, so this go. is an actual performance. That's not a trailer, but that's fine. Let's watch this. Yeah. Instead. Yeah. Give him a little clip of it, Doug, so you can see it. <sighs> 
See her? Yeah. Yeah, I get the I get the picture. It's crazy, right? So yeah, but can the can the uh, audience actually see that? They can't see her. Uh, well, what I'm saying is like, so the the projected image is it projected or is this just like you know overlaid for the video? Oh, okay, that's an interesting it, question. It's probably a hologram, but honestly, the audience like, doesn't matter because there's millions of people watching on TV, right? That's the big deal. Yeah. Well, you yeah, but I, are the well, like Justin's point is the audience looking at nothing? Yeah, on stage? but like they're just faking, like oh, uh, like you, reacting to something that's not even there. So here's what this pulls up for me is that because whenever they have shows like this, like American Idol did this, brilliant brilliant uh, format. They put out these kids, talented, but because you follow them along from their tryouts to the finals to whatever, you automatically turn them into a star. You want to buy their albums or whatever. If you're watching this show and what you're doing now is you're watching the avatar mm -hmm. and you're, you're, you're connected to the avatar that's performing, yeah. what they're literally doing is making the avatar the star and the celebrity. Yeah, right. So now then you can character. sell that. Right. Yeah. You merchandise it. Now, here's my question. Who owns the Avatar likeness? Well, the Fox. show does. Probably yeah. Fox, yeah. Well, that's the same with American Idol. That's what was so tough about a lot of them that would make it through. Uh, they had these contracts where like, they basically own like- No way. Uh, maybe I like four that. or five of their albums. Well, hold on a whoa, second. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, so, hold, hold on a second. Yeah. Yes, but- You guys didn't know that? But it's not a forever contract. So it's you, a pretty airtight contract. But so not forever. Okay, so like Kelly it. Clarkson, right? Who's one of the last yeah, like big yeah. names. Took, that took I, her a while. I think it was like three albums or something took her to get out of that Shut contract. your face. Yeah, I did course. not. What do you mean, of course? Well, does that make sense? If you sign up for the show, that's going to put you all this promotion, put you out there, whatever. You sign a contract that says if you win... You do this many albums with us, you'll make this much. Well, I just figured that's one of the kickers if they if they actually win the damn thing. I mean, they're getting all the views, the advertising, and money that's coming from that. Yeah, they're also going to get their greedy fingers in the actual. Well, of course they are, dude. That's the music industry, <laughs> but dude. Hold on a second. I mean, it makes sense when you say that. It's just but a hold on a second. Here's my dick question. Move. I didn't even know. But here's my question. Yeah. Kelly Clarkson. Let's say she wins. Uh, she, you know, she won American Idol. She crushed. She's really good. Really talented. She had to do three albums with them before she go off on her own. Yeah. This is a fake avatar. Yeah. Does Fox own that forever? Because you can't own someone's likeness for the rest of their life, or maybe right. you can, but nobody. Well, I guess would ever the question that. would be: Who created Probably. the Avatar? Did Fox create it, or did the did the well, Fox? Of course, they're not going <laughs> to. You don't think they allowed them to build their character? I imagine they built their character. Yeah, but I would imagine that the that the Through Avatar. Their Doug, means. are you searching about the Kelly Clarkson thing? Because I'm really curious to know how much money they got from her. Because she went she went real big, and she's done several yeah. albums now. Yeah. yeah. So I want to know how much money they have to sign a contract to do albums and then tour, and they all tour together. So I think it's like the five or ten finalists from from uh, American Idol would go on tour, mm. and everybody would make a certain amount of money. Obviously, the closer you are to winning, the more money you'd get, or something like that. I believe that was in their contract. Because I mean, if that's the case, Case, talk about a win all the way around for them. I yeah. mean, they Bro, just brilliant. they crush on the obviously they the advertising, the, albums, the views, and then they tie them like there's I, no risk for them. No, and can you imagine? Can you think of a better way to advertise and pump up a new album coming out when you're emotionally invested in this? Right, person's, right, right. But well, here's, but again, back to the avatar. Okay, because it's a fake image. Do they own it forever? In other words, this girl signs a contract with them for three albums, and then she's off on her own. They still own I imagine the they would, and then she would just have to recreate herself <clears throat> as something else. No, right. no, there's got to be some sort of, or else why? You're they, you're a greedy um, uh, music executive. You don't think that you're going to try and lock that okay, in? Okay, but hold uh, on. Let's go on the other end of that. You greedy music executive. Would these people even ever do this right, without, if, without this opportunity? Okay, what'd you find, Doug? So it's even more dramatic than that. What? It was a seven record deal. Dude, seven Holy record shit. deal. Are you so serious? 16 yeah, years later, are. she was finally able to get out of the deal. When 16 she years later? Yes, when she released her seventh album. Okay. Wow. Can you, can you look up the Avatar oh, one? You know what's crazy is? about that is what is the average amount of albums that a, a an maybe, artist... Yeah, maybe three, maybe two even. Yeah, yeah it's like... Like, yeah. name name an artist that you're a huge fan of that has seven albums that you even know. I know. I know. That's Dude, crazy. You have to work your butt off. Yeah, maybe like Red Hot Chili and, Peppers. And so how much... Does it say how much of the seven albums that, like, they get, like... I'm not seeing that. Because, I mean, I wonder if it, she has, like, the, the like deal is you have 5%. to make seven. Yeah, and you only make 5% of it. Or does she, like... And doesn't Simon Cowell own part of uh, the oh, yeah. title? He's, I think he's invested in it. Yeah. He has a, a board member. But, again, put yourself in, in Kelly Clarkson's shoes or whatever. Would they have ever... Here you are. You want to be yeah. a professional singer. You want to be a music artist. The opportunities are so 
Yeah, their so argument small. is you'll never get found uh, otherwise. Exactly. Right? So, and then you're like, I'll try out for the show. And yeah. they're like, you're on. Here's the contract. Do you want it or not? You're going to say yes. Now, do you think that is the same thing? Let's say someone who came in fourth place, right? They're eliminated. And they so they didn't become. On, yeah, they still own their rights. They too. do for, for the tour. They have to do the tour. And I believe at a certain level, you also have to do like a, a an American Idol Because how much would that suck is if you, you don't even win. Well, wasn't because, it Adam Lambert? Or didn't he? He didn't win, right? No. Yeah, so he, they still own his albums. Although I would, so here's the way I would look at it. It might even be better to be like tenth place, not have such a hard contract, but then get the visibility. Yeah. And be able to do because like Adam Lambert got second. Let's be honest. Yeah. He was first. He crushed that. If you ever watched well, that season, there was he, he, the there other was guy a guy from him. Santa Cruz that was like a rock singer or whatever, and he was really good, but he was like down. I don't know if he was like five or six really? place or something, but yeah, I, I think he's. But so they probably own his stuff too, which is a total bummer. Yeah, yeah. Dude. It's it's the, in, in my opinion, it's one of the smartest marketing str- machines of all time because when you feel, I because I I don't I, I watched the first maybe a few seasons, you watch them from beginning to. And you are emotionally invested. You want them to succeed. You want to buy their album just yeah. to support them. Now, we took this conversation a whole different direction than I thought. I just think it's interesting. This is just one more step in the direction yeah. of us being plugged in. That's what I think. Yeah. It, like being able to create a fake version of yourself. And then the, like the interview clips that I saw, these they were talking about these kids. You can see how relieved they were and just how, how great it is for them to be able to have this avatar go out and be well, them. The, you know? In so terms wild. of the brilliance of that, uh, so you've seen this with the gorillas, right? Yes. And, and so they, they were kind of the first to pioneer this whole like – avatar version of themselves and then tour so it'd be interesting to see now based on technology where that's at like they could have these holographic images of them they could actually like pretend to play on stage and just literally maybe play backstage or just yeah. even just play you know the music uh over the speakers and not even be there well you could make the case that even before them was uh, blue man group of course yeah i mean because they were the first to be able to do that right they're interchangeable right mm-hmm. isn't there like a ton of different yep. blue men that go in there From a, play for a, the group. Think about it from a business perspective. Oh, it's, oh, it's super brilliant. smart it's, business it's, wise. It's brilliant because what's one of the downsides of uh, of that kind of success? Getting recognized, you can't live your normal life. If you're the gorillas, people don't even know what you look like unless you're a super hardcore fan. Yeah. So you just hang out. So that's m- my opinion of all this. It's going to put such a positive spin on yeah. being in the virtual world and not being yourself out in public that it's just going to get us one step closer to this whole We're idea. Ready Player of, One, dude. Yeah. It's it's getting closer. That's what, that's what it reminded me of. Ready yeah. Player yeah. One. Yeah. That what no, I just saw. It, it 100% remind me of that too. I mean, I think yeah. they nailed that. I think it's really going that direction. I finally watched. The other one that's like that uh, that you you brought up on the show like a month or two ago you saw it in theater I just saw it on TV uh, Free Man oh, oh I didn't Free see Man. that yet the yeah, Free yeah. Guy it's yeah, so yeah. good right it, yeah oh, oh, it's a really, great movie everybody says it's really good I like well it. I similar look. concept of talking to all this like so he's trapped in a in a in a video game yeah, right? yeah so yeah. Sim- similar type of concept so speaking of shows and stuff uh, season three of you is out oh, yeah, I'm don't ruin yeah. it for me yeah. I haven't seen I it yet first episode you know what they do so well is they they create and I don't this is gonna anything because it's like this in the first two seasons you have maniacal crazy murderers these are literally like like psychopaths psychopaths and somehow they're likable they do such a good job (laughs) writing it yeah that you like them even though they're completely terrible murdering people like how's their mind what great writing yeah yeah Yeah. and jessica and i were watching it and you remember the end of the last season right yeah yeah. how she's like i'm pregnant or whatever So it's this whole interesting, the first few episodes are kind of, you know. Yeah, now they're like the dynamic deal. It's interesting. Oh, bro. That's yeah. really, really. Yeah, don't ruin it for me. Yeah, I, wanted, I, I wanted to watch it, but the only reason why I didn't watch it last night was uh, my cue popped up Succession, which is like one of my favorite shows right now, too. So you watch that so, one. Yeah, man, TV just gets good in October, I guess. I don't Dude, even, I guess yeah, I never we really had paid this dry to... spell, and now so we got way too many things to watch. Is, I mean, is that, I mean, does anyone know, like. Is that because it gets cold? They well, know no, I think, I think just in the summer, there's way less television being watched. It's summertime. Yeah. You're out, That's you're on vacation, I mean. stuff like that. So your best shows probably aren't typically in the summer. You probably wait till school's back in. And everybody's at home watching TV and around, right? I imagine that's yeah, right. Yeah, I wonder right? that if there's a bunch of delays in production and then all of a sudden now it's kind of catching up. And so now all these major productions are finally kind of pushing well, through. Well, in you, they refer to COVID. 
So I know they were filming it. Uh -huh. They obviously filmed season three during this whole thing. Oh, yeah. They did that in billions, too. Did they? Yeah, most of the shows now are, are bringing it up where you see them wearing masks uh -huh. and, and stuff like that. Speaking of Netflix, did you hear that there were, I guess, some or people organizing trying to like yes, they trying actually, to get them to take down Dave Chappelle? They actually fired her. I was I was wondering if they were going to do that or not. They fired the organizer. Yeah. Yeah, because they were going to do like a, wow. like a strike or yeah, something. Yeah, they're trying to do a mass walkout, right, and about you know trying to say that Dave Chappelle's stand-up was uh, trying transphobic yeah and they were all trying to do this big walkout on netflix to get them to pull it off and i'm so glad that they did i'm, I'm glad so they stood their ground at least they're consistent because you guys remember the hoopla over cuties now, yep. by the way i find it interesting that you had a bunch of employees ready to quit over dave Chappelle's comedy show but they have cuties up there which is uh, I, I, terrible i mean it's terrible the way it depicts world. children yeah and nobody said nothing i know there was definitely some backlash from other people they stood their ground, fine, but at least they're consistent, and they did it with uh, with the, with Chappelle. Yeah, they yeah. decided not to pull it down. So uh, as long as you're consistent, I, I don't have a problem. Yeah, it's when the inconsistency happens, I get super. You know, super I got something that's gonna make you excited, Sal. Uh oh, okay. <laughs> what is it? Uh, I know how like you really got into like the Twilight series <laughs> what? as of late, right? No, like, no idea. Dude, guess what? He's Batman uh, now. What? The same yeah, guy? Rob Patterson. He's Batman? Yeah, dude. You're Why? Team Edward, right? So Why would they do this that? should like fit right in your They made house. him Batman? Yeah. Weird. You know, know what's weird? It's hold, a weird choice. Hold on Is it just He's catch the generation like a coming up, right? Kind of face. Hold on a second. Let's do this play a little devil's advocate. Okay. Do you guys remember the first Batman in in theaters when we were kids that went crazy? Mm -hmm. Michael was it Keaton? Michael Keaton? Michael mm -hmm. Keaton. Okay. Everybody had a problem with Michael Keaton. Up until that point, he was Mr. Mom, comedian, kind of goofy guy. Mm -hmm. He arguably played one of the best Batmans. He really did. The first one, he did a good job and it crushed. It was a blockbuster, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ben Affleck. Everybody made fun of. He actually did a decent Batman. He, I terrible. Thought. I thought he would do a decent yeah, no, Batman. I he, uh, no, I thought he. I thought yeah. he tanked. Dude. You thought, uh, the only Christian one that was Bale, worse was like. Val Kilmer, right? Val Kilmer was. Yeah. The worst. They say Val Kilmer was the worst, and yeah. then I think Ben Affleck was the second to worst. I don't think he was as bad as people thought, yeah. he, as people said he would be, in my opinion. Yeah. So yeah. who who knows? You know, we can't trust your rating. I don't know. Right? <laughs> stuff like hey, are you? No, but this one's interesting. It's like uh, it, it's like they're definitely trying to like you know, revitalize the whole franchise and like get it back out there. But uh, I'm, I have no idea where it's going to go. Are they going to keep it dark? Cause I hate it when they went, it looks kind of dark. Yeah. Okay. So it's the thing is I, it actually looks not bad. Like it doesn't look too bad. I'm just curious to see with him playing Batman, what that's going to be like. That's cool. I, I, I like the, I think of all the comic book uh, movies, Batman is the best by far. Oh yeah. yeah, Joker. That whole lineup has got to be Batman rules, dude. Yeah, by far. Are you gonna share with the audience your uh, rollerblading accident? What? <laughs> so dumb. So, tell them, bro. So dumb. There, I, I know people are watching you, you right now. Extreme sports. And you guys can see the the little. It looks like a big pimple at first. That's no. why I didn't say anything to I, him I don't last get pimples. time. I have but uh, no, I guess you had a, a big rollerblading no, accident. No, you know tell what the I did. Audience what so, happened. so we were uh, we were obviously up in Truckee, and we have the the. PRX set up and I put the dip bar on there mm -hmm. and I got close to the cage because I wanted it to be my hands to be closer together. So the dip parallel dip bars go like this, right? So they start yeah, out here like a V wide and then they get closer. I wanted them close together and I wanted resistance. So I added resistance with the band, which actually works tremendous. Now the problem is obviously when you get pulled down by your upper body, it wants to pull your body forward. So the first rep, I was like, dink, and I just hit my head on the, on the, on the cage. Yeah, are we going to try and sue PRX over that? Or no, no. That, was my, that was my own fault. <laughs> Speaking of PRX, I haven't worked out in my cage at home in a long time. So I have just a regular traditional squat cage or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And But for the, and for the longest time now, I've been just using the PRX cages in here because yeah. you guys know that my, my baby son's room is above the garage and uh, yeah. he's napping. I ain't going to do it because I'll wake him up. So I worked out. I've been working out here. The PRX cages are now I see the contrast. The most stable cages I've yeah. ever used. Oh, they're awesome! You know the, the most stable. The irony of that—that that was the one thing I was concerned about. One hundred percent. When we first were looking at doing, I was like, "Oh man, into the wall like that? Is it going to feel?" They are—they're way more solid. They're the most yeah. stable cages I've ever used. Yeah, and I've used power. I've used them all, and we have terrible walls too in this studio uh, to work with. Fake just walls. So you no, know. yeah, it's, yeah, it's awful, and it's still holding super strong. Yeah. But yeah, I'm conflicted right now because I have like one of the the older model racks that just was able to fit in my other house. And mm -hmm. now it's like, uh, I have it kind of sitting there. I haven't like assembled it in the new house yet. 
Cause I'm just like, dude, like I I'm spoiled coming in here and there's like the nice tall racks with the, um, with, with the pull up bars yeah, yeah. and all the different grips. Oh, yours doesn't have that one. No, it's, it's the old one. That's just like, there's no standard pull -up bar on the top. Yeah. Oh. So I was like, dude, do I sell this? Do I get, you know, upgrade and get like new stuff? And I'm like, Ugh. so I'm probably going to upgrade. Dude. I just can't well, what, now hold on. You, you, Cause you got a big garage. What if you did one on your side? So you have the new one and the older ones. Just doubling up. Yeah, dude. so your wife and yeah. you can work out at the same time if you want. Because that probably happens all it's the time, right? Happen. Really? <laughs> you guys don't work out together? I mean, it's, uh, sometimes, but like totally randomly it happens. It's but. foreplay, dude. Work out yeah. with your wife. I, I mean, we it do, is. but I, it's, I never get a good workout anymore. Now that we have Max, if, if that means it's a family workout, right? Oh, so it's just like, yeah. yeah. And he just, he'll come running up to you. So I can't do anything heavy. Oh man. So you're pressing yeah, he's underneath yeah, you? Yeah. Yeah. So oh, hell no. Yeah. Anytime that he's in the garage, unless I put him in the truck bed, sometimes I do that Yeah. where I stick him, make it like a playpen. Oh yeah. So let him run around the back of the truck, throw a bunch of toys in there, let him run around in the yeah, truck bed yeah, while yeah, we work. Right. That works out. Dude, sometimes. speaking of the kids, I don't think I've talked about this on the show. So, uh, Jessica has been teaching, uh, our baby just so, you know, a few sign language. Uh, so good. Things. Okay. So he and he's hilarious because he's picking up on it. He's telling dirty jokes. And he, no, <laughs> no. So she's taught him like five or six yeah. signs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he, so this right here, this right here means he wants uh, milk. breast Train milk. Goes yeah. into the cave. Yeah. This means breast milk, right? Yeah. But and he, that's like his favorite thing in the world. So he gets yeah. super excited and he's like. Yeah. Oh, no matter what he does, <laughs> and we're just oh, dude, we're just cracking up. Like it doesn't matter what it is. Like, what do you want? The, what do you want, Aurelius? Like yeah, she just yeah. fed you. Like, yeah. calm down. But you know what? I think it's done. I think it's accelerated his yeah. um, like his desire to speak too. Yeah. Because now he'll try and say a word along oh, with. Yeah. Now he's getting attention, and he can kind of like yeah express himself. It's just cool because now he communicates with us. So now I see. It'll what he be wants. interesting as he gets older. I, I think I told you off air. We were talking that you know I have this theory that the the terrible twos, uh, which normally land somewhere between two and three and a yeah. half, right for most parents. I, I, I'm willing to bet that a lot of that has to do with their inability to communicate. They're right at that because that, right, that's dude. that's that transition when they're they're starting. They to, can't like verbalize their feelings. Yeah, they could say a couple words. They're starting to maybe piece two or three together, but they can't really articulate how they're feeling or thinking all the time. Yeah. But yet they know they can speak. And so, just imagine as an adult how it's a lot frustrating. Of frustration. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I imagine that would be really frustrating yeah. even as an adult. So imagine being a kid and you're tr you you know what you want, but then you can't quite communicate it or say it. Yeah. And I would guess that that probably has. so it'd be interesting to see if the sign language helps bridge that gap. And so maybe you won't get the, the, the terrible twos as much. I wish we would have started. We'll I see, told he gets that. frustrated now and it cracks me up. It's actually it's bad because I laugh when he gets frustrated because he's cute. So he's mm -hmm. like, he'll kick his legs, oh, and then I'll just crack up. And yeah. I think that makes it more frustrating. You know? so gotta, <laughs> dude, his, his little personality. So and I remember this with the older kids, too, right around a year. They start to like their personality really starts to come out, mm -hmm. and he's just a, a he's like a he loves humor and he lo he's like such a little clown. He's very affectionate, but like we were shopping at the mall this weekend, and you know we're hanging out and I'm holding him and I take my mask off and I kiss him, kiss him, kiss him, kiss him, and then he does this. He goes like this with his hand and I stop and he pulls my mask over my face. He's like, stop kissing. Me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. Yeah, I'm, done right I'm done with your face trying to kiss me this whole time. <laughs> Is Jessica still blending up like some steak and stuff for him too? She Is does. That, yeah. So the primary dish that she makes is we'll get the butcher box grass fed uh, tri tip. Uh huh. She'll cook it. And then she'll cut it and blend it, and then she'll blend it with uh, sweet potatoes and asparagus oh, nice. or other vegetables, and add a little bit of olive oil. And he just goes crazy with it. Yeah, he absolutely loves it. It's like his favorite dish. Uh, I finally got uh, ever to eat some broccoli. We did like this dish with the steak tips, like a teriyaki kind of a dish. Of course, you know, because it's like sugar. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> what is teriyaki? It's just drizzled sugar. <laughs> but it was really good, dude. I highly suggest. You do what? Kind of the tips? So the steak tips. Yeah, you you cook those like a medium. You can order that at well. Butcher Box too. Yeah, you should. Did you grill them or did you put them in the? Grilled them first, oh, and then like chopped it up, and then. Now, now, do you know? Do you know what the, in the uh, bowl with rice? And, do you know what kind of cut the tips come from? Do you guys know? Uh, Doug, do you you normally are on top of this stuff near the butt. Probably, I'm just gonna guess. <clears throat> no, I mean they're I know they're tip? they're tip. typically really tasty, right? Yeah, no, they're real tasty, tender. I, it's so funny, you guys. We all we almost I went and barbecued after we had such a. 
terrible experience with the the chef that I had come up to barbecue for us while we were up in Truckee. Oh, uh, that was a bummer. I, when I got home, like when I got back, I barbecued this weekend for the same thing too. I was like, I need some good barbecue. Yeah. So now, I made the baby back ribs. And what do you guys do? Oh, the way you do the ribs was so much better. Yeah, yeah. I love the way you do the ribs. What do you guys do when it's like raining and stuff? You don't grill, so you just do more stuff in the oven? I still grill. You do? Because mm-hmm. we have we have a, like a California yeah. room. Oh, yeah. so we It didn't can... rain till later. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I actually got caught. It started raining. I was trying to catch up this weekend on all these like, you know, little projects and things I promised the kids that I'd be a part of like building shelves and stuff for Ethan. And then outside I'm like mixing concrete and doing all this for this new uh, tetherball pole because we left some of these things like the, um, uh, the trampoline we just left. I'm like, I'm not moving this to the new place dude it was just like i would have to break the whole thing down reassemble it but i'm like i'll just get a new one once we get to the place so i haven't done that yet but like the tetherball everett would literally just be out there for like four or five hours just like he was just like making a point like it was somebody at school like (laughs) (laughs) knuckles just bleeding dude and so i'm like i gotta get this going again because it's a good outlet for his anger yeah Yeah. Yeah. so i worked on that all week i got that all set up for you should put the uh so you you should put the trampoline in the ground have you seen uh, yeah, do that? I've seen that. I've seen um, I've easy seen to cover too. You can, and... Easy to cover in the winter time. Then you just throw some plywood over How do the top. They do of that? Do they make you a deck? Just first? Dig it out. No, you just dig a just hole. Dig it out, yeah. You just dig a hole and you put it put it in the hole so that it's so that the the top of the trampoline is level with the ground. Really? So it's great. They miss and they fall. They just fall on the ground. They don't fall off, which you see yeah. sometimes with kids. With it. don't trampolines have like a high injury rate? Or am I tripping? Oh yeah, yeah for sure. But it, the thing is, they're learning all these things at uh, their gymnastic mm-hmm. uh, course, and so. They can do things I wouldn't even have thought of. Like, it's just insane watching them now doing all these brannies and flips and, like, you know, front, back, front, back. I've, I've been meaning to ask you. I'm so glad you brought that up. I've been meaning to ask because you're obviously ahead of me with the whole gymnastic thing. I just got Max into it. Yeah. Um, I, we were there this weekend, and I was noticing that um, you you would think, or I, I, at least I would think that, um, that the boys would be more rough and tumble and adventurous with climbing and jumping and so that. The girls are. And I, I don't know if that's the, because of the age, because I'm talking about, age. yeah, the two to yeah. four year old range or whatever. The um, And I, I thought at first I thought it was Max. I thought, oh, he's just not going to be a real physical kid. You know what I'm saying? He's not really like aggressively doing crazy mm-hmm. stuff yet, leaping off things or climbing the rope on his own or the ladder. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then I, the, there was a full class, probably 20 kids in there. And it was I noticed that there's girls that are the same age or even a little bit younger that were hanging on the monkey bar and and kicking their feet up and then uh-huh. climbing the rope by themselves. And it was all the boys that weren't doing it. Now, were that. they all beginners together? Or because sometimes people put their kids... In- yeah, Katrina even mm-hmm. asked one of the girls because uh, I, I told her, I said, man, that one little girl... She must have been doing this for a long time, or she must be older than what she looks. Katrina goes, no, I asked her. She goes, she's younger than Max. She's only oh, two. Wow. And I'm like, oh, my God. She was doing all kind of balancing on one leg and just a lot of things that he's he kind of like we take him in there and it's just like free play mainly mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying it's like free play around a bunch of kids and you know they try and keep them organized where they kind of go in this like circle and do all the obstacles together yeah. and you know he'll be like he'll start it then he'll like take a right and just <laughs> leave the class and go do it I always love watching them when they first start playing a, they start uh, playing a sport and you'll see them like I remember when my son was real little I don't remember how he was like six or something they're playing soccer and he'll just stop and start playing with the grass you yeah. know, and you're like hey we gotta play oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the kids just like walk off the field, go do something. Get that back was Ethan the in the middle of the game, taking like a blade of grass and like, you know, showing him oh, what I taught him to make it whistle. <laughs> yeah. In the middle of the game, like he's like, like "Dad, that was a really ball. good blade right there. It was like this thick." Dude, I used to lose my mind. Dude. That's where that was before I like pulled myself back. Like, hey, dude, like this is your stuff. Like, <laughs> like I had to just like back off. You know, that's why they're in gymnastics. You yeah. know, but like I was like, "Get the ball." <laughs> hey, hey, I was going to Are you guys watching this uh, new like arms race that seems to be happening now with China? Yeah, so Russia, Russia and first, right? Hypersonic missile. Now we saw a display from China mm-hmm. with a, a nice okay, hypersonic so, nuclear so in, missile. Yeah, so intercontinental ballistic missiles, what they typically were is they were missiles that would launch up into basically the the, you know, atmosphere. outer ridge of the atmosphere or into space fly and then come down onto a country. And this was like a big worry because the U.S. could launch missiles from the homeland and hit the Soviet Union and vice versa, and everybody freaked out. Mm-hmm. Well, the defenses have been built 
theoretically against those kind of missiles that come in and enter the atmosphere. They know when they're going to happen or whatever. Right. So what they've developed are these low altitude flying hypersonic missiles. And they fly so fast. You get that no you, defense. Basically. You can't do shit. Yeah. There's nothing you can do. Yeah. They're like 21,000 miles an hour. Just, just flying. Yeah. And there ain't a damn thing you can do. There's no Patriot missile is going to stop that thing. No, nothing's fast enough to, to do it. So the U.S. has our own hypersonic missiles. Then Russia did their own. Yeah. kind of, And they show everybody else what we can do. Yeah. China just la- launched one. And I guess it took us by surprise because they're more advanced uh, than we believe. Oh, is that the video that you sent over to our group yeah. thread? Oh, yeah. I didn't get a chance that, to really read it. I'm, I'm the only one concerned, apparently. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know. I, dude, we need to come up with the death ray. That's uh, an <laughs> obvious next move. You know what, though? Here's the thing. the If if we learn anything from the Cold War, it's that the what seems to be the best predictor of peace is the threat of mutual destruction. Right. Because if the Soviet Union and the U.S. didn't have nukes, I would bet everything that we would have gone to war. Sure. I would 100%. Yep. But they never did because it's like, what are you going to do? Like, yeah. we're going to launch. They're going to launch. Everybody dies. Like, nobody wins. So I feel like, you know, that's still... It's when one country has, happening. like, a, a tremendous advantage that there becomes a risk because then they feel like they can flex, you know. But, you know, hypersonic missiles, everybody's putting them together. Yeah, everybody's sort of getting in line. Sweet. I know. So we'll see. I don't know, man. We'll see what, yeah, that's we'll, scary, we'll see what yeah. happens. At our expense. Kind of yeah. yeah. Cool. Are you, you guys getting ready for uh, Halloween and everything with the kids? Oh, yeah. I Dude, I, I get in like this weird – because my kids always have really – uniquely weird ideas for Halloween costumes. <laughs> oh, really? And I'm like, dude, this is not going to work out for you. <laughs> this is such an obscure idea. Like nobody knows what you are. <laughs> like, you a ran- like a random yeah. character like from like some Nickelodeon cartoons. Like, like newsy, like guy. That's, <laughs> and then the other one's like, you know, like some plague doctor outfit thing. From like, <laughs> I love that dude. I'm it's like, so great. I'm like, what are you? Some weird, like steampunk nerds. Like what? Like nobody gets this, you know. You're 11. You're eight. Yeah. Like do something normal. Be a Spider Man yeah. or Batman. Like be like a karate guy or like yeah, <laughs> like a karate guy. I don't know, like army man, football player. Yeah. Something like recognizable. Oh. Yeah. Costumes have come a long way because when I when we were kids, <laughs> do you guys remember wearing the the costumes that your mom would buy at the grocery store? And they have the plastic mask and the oh, plastic yeah. like sheet that would go. Over my mom body. always made them. We <laughs> yeah, made our dude. costumes. Grow. You made your costumes. Yeah, and well, I kept. Whatever. I kept my going. Mom that. Still makes I, them for my kids. Yeah, I kept it going for even adulthood. Yeah. Most of, most of all my Halloween. Well, you costumes. had good costumes then. If yeah, they're made. Yeah, yeah. I no, mean, I try. I, right? No, my mom would go to the grocery store and be like, "What do you want to be? Spider Man? Okay." And it was literally for people yeah. to know. Like, it's, it's a plastic like Spider Man jammies and it's like the gas station outfit. No, it's literally a plastic cover you put over your normal clothes and a plastic mask. That would your your breath would condense in it and by the time you've gone to three houses and there's, right, and there's right here, 15 yeah. other kids yeah. that look just like you exactly in the school the same. <laughs> and I'm walking around this plastic like gown uh, yeah. oh, your Spider-Man. mom makes you shop at the same place yeah huh? dude yeah dude <laughs> you know, and then the I don't homie. know I don't know what we're gonna do for so we took Max actually this weekend we went to uh, we went to a, a Halloween store and it was Did pretty he get scared. Yeah, like it was funny how he got scared. Like he really wanted to go in because it looked super interesting to him, and uh, he wouldn't let go of my hand. But he wanted to go through all the aisles and he wanted to look at everything. But he was like a death grip yeah. on my hand. And at the front, they had this like zombie and skeleton like that was making noises and turning. And they would only do that every once in a while. And I guess when we came in, it wasn't going off, so it didn't get him right. But we were coming around the store. And he could hear it like an aisle away and you see him kind of look to the side and then he sees it moving and he like jerks on my hand and like sprints out the door. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we run out the door and he's like looking back the whole time, yeah. you know, that they're going to come after us. So this is such a definitive difference. Like, so when you're younger, like you love scaring little kids, you're like, ha ha ha, I gotcha. <laughs> now, like you have a little kid and you're like taking them to like some like house for trick or treating. And there's always that one like psychotic asshole guy, right? Right. He's like sitting with this like pumpkin head on and just like totally still and lifeless. And the poor kids like going to grab the things. And like, I seriously, like one of my kids almost like peed his pants. Dude, it was so, I wanted to punch this guy in the no, face. Bro, hey, that's we, so true. My buddies and I are so these guys right here. Oh, so I want to kill my this best guy. Friend, I was like, dude, I will end you. My best friend. And this is obviously before we all had kids. We all have kids now, right? So we haven't done it since we've had kids. But before we had kids, he always used to do his whole house up. And he has this really cool like um he, he has these like iron gate doors that you can't see through that you open up and it's like i don't know what do you call those like front 
front pantry type areas or whatever, like in the front of a house, you know, but it's, you could sit out there and it's, it's completely fenced patio? in. Yeah. But like an enclosed patio. I don't know okay. if there's like a term. What well, you know what I mean though? Right. Sure, so sure. it's an enclosed patio and in there he would go all out. Like a little haunted house. Oh yeah. Fog machine going. There would always be someone on the rocker that looks like they're dead and they're yeah. really not. And we would all hide in different places. So when the kids come up and we would, <laughs> we had walkie talkies and everything. So we uh, would know when a group of like kids were coming. Oh, we used to so scare no, the dude, shit I, out of kids. Bro, dude. So I would have oh. killed you. Dude, you gave him nightmares for like two years. Yes. <laughs> no, he's <laughs> right. Dude, it's bullshit. There's a, there's, so I, I got to deal with this. When my daughter was probably four i was taking her trick-or-treating and i she would want me to hold her because by this point by this time she's four and she knows there's gonna be some scary stuff there was a haunted house and we're walking up to it and i can see there's a guy in a gorilla costume <laughs> who's standing on the roof yeah. who's gonna jump down and scare kids yeah and i literally out loud don't you dare i have my four-year-old daughter i'll throw you off that roof and he's like waves at me okay and I just walked by. Because <laughs> I swear to God, I would have grabbed him by his mask and thrown him off the roof uh, if he scared my four-year-old uh, daughter. Yeah, dude. Yeah, so I don't know. We'll see We'll see what happens. Yeah, I don't think we'd do it now because now I see my poor son. You know what I'm saying? When you see that. Imagine look, an adult. Yeah, no. I, well, I it's mean, one thing to get like the teenagers. Like, I'm all for that. That's yeah. what you got to yeah, do. Yeah, you got to get the they older it. kids, but like the little kids. Well, like, that's the that's. On, I think, I mean, we try that's to easy. do that, right? You try to get the kids that were in that like 10 to 13 range. 10's too young. 13 and up. He's scared of shit of you want. Ten's not too. Ten's uh, not too young. Ten's a fair game. Ten's, yeah, you think ten? Yeah, ten's, really? Ten's fair ten game. is fair game, bro. Yeah. Ten, you're probably like, walking around uh, by yourself with or with I, your older I, my brother. My like eight and below. That's, that's yeah, I feel like that's good. Like, what grade are you in at eight? Eight years old. How, what grade are you in? Yes, yeah, bro. So ten is like grade, fourth grade, grade, bro. Oh yeah, yeah you're playing. Bro, I was kissing girls by that. Time. Hey, hold on a second. You kiss girls. girls and you can kiss girls. You can get scared. Hey, hold on a second. Hold on a second. It's not like that anymore, dude. Kids are way younger now at the same age. Like when kids ten now, they're like seven, or when you were a kid. Yeah, but we just got done talking about how they hit puberty and stuff earlier, so that's no excuse. That's not so the they same. Should, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> ten is the, the Bro, cutoff. You, how old were you when you were walking miles home from school or to school? That's a bad question to ask me. Why is it bad? Because <laughs> because like I've six. talked about this before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I've talked about this before. <laughs> my on. my sister was in first grade. I was in third grade. Uh, okay, and we were crossing the freeway and shit at that age, dude. <laughs> so yeah, literally gangster. like two miles away hey, from there. Hey, yeah. You know, you ever seen the yeah. sign that's like. Like, watch out. And it's like a person, like two kids running across a freeway. Watch out, people, because that was you guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we were literally, the- I told you guys that story before. Like, I, I went back to my, where I grew up in Modesto, like, this, or at this time in my life, I was in Modesto. Nice and place, nice I, I don't know if you guys ever do this because I don't know how many of you yeah. guys have actually lived in as nearly as many homes as I did. I think grew up in nine different homes. So every once in a while, if I go by that town or whatever, I went, oh, let's go check out our old neighborhood and see. And I remember we went by that. This was maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago or whatever. And we went we went by to go check the house out in the neighborhood. And I remember uh, taking Katrina, like, oh, let's go down this. I want to, st- let me show you. My sister and I, we used to go to school. I'll show you my school. And I remember driving, being like, God, I swore the school was sooner than this. You know, so it was <laughs> literally <laughs> like we two miles away. And Katrina's days. like, are you sure you know yeah. where you're going? I'm like, no, I this is all familiar. I said, you cr-. She goes, you really crossed a, f- a four lane like highway over like that. And I said, oh yeah, no, God. this is where we go right here. And yeah, I get there. I'm like, holy we crap. Scurried. And Real then I'm doing the math scurried. on like our age. Cause I know what grade I was at. I'm like, God damn, man. I'm all of you go <laughs> with my little sister. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's why you were such a hard ass. And Modesto, I think is rated like number one in crime in the United States. It's yeah. like up there with like one of the, like the highest crime cities, <laughs> in all of the country. stripes. Real quick, I hope you're enjoying the show. I want to talk about one of our sponsors, Buy Optimizers. Now, they make natural digestive enzymes that help relieve things like constipation or bloating, especially if you're eating a diet that's very high in protein or carbohydrates for performance, for muscle building. You're trying to boost your metabolism. You're eating these meals and you feel like your digestion is just not great. Try Buy Optimizers. They actually created enzymes for athletes, people trying to build muscle, people trying to improve their performance. It's the only enzyme product that I personally use, and those of you that watch the show know that I have gut issues, and they're challenging me all the time. I love their product. And because you, of course, listen to Mind Pump, we have a discount for you. So if you're interested, head over to masszymes.com. That's M-A-S-S-Z-Y-M-E-S.com forward slash Mind Pump, and use the code MINDPUMP10. That's MINDPUMP10 with no space for 10% off your order. All right, here's the rest of the show. First question is from Fit as Trucker. Barbell rows, supinated, pronated, dumbbell, or penlay? 
Which one is better for building the bag? All, all right. the above. Yeah, they all are. They're all good. Right. All right. Let's break them down so that we can kind of tell, talk about like the the I guess the differences between them. Right. So let's start with the supinated barbell row. So that's just where the hands are facing up. This is what supinated means. Now the difference between this and a traditional barbell row overhand is that you're going to get a little bit more bicep involvement. And that rotating of the hands brings the elbows in closer to the body. So I noticed when I go supinated, I feel I can get more of a squeeze in my lats than when I use a bit, you know, when I use the overhand grip. Um, dumbbell, I get a little bit more mid back with that because of the rotation at the top, especially when it's one arm at a time. Penlay is more of a power move, and I don't typically teach that to anyone unless they're strong and stable in all of the other, you know, traditional rows. Like I never had my like everyday average clients do a penlay row unless they were really consistent with me uh, for a while. So that's kind of the, the, the breakdown of them, I taught, but they're all good. I taught penlay rows pretty early to a client. I mean, I think a bent over row is, I mean, it's not the easiest exercise to teach somebody and it does take some skill. So it wouldn't be, I would never start someone on a penlay. I'd but, go dumbbell first, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, you would go through, but I mean, you, once you understand how to do a bent over row pretty well and you can keep your, your, if you can keep your back in a you know neutral spine, and and you can if you can load a regular row and keep good form, then you could probably teach a penle row, which you I love. Get the stabilize and brace and really that good. technique really down. But yeah, 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 really really good. Did you teach it? Would you teach it? Yeah. I would. I did. Um, yeah, it'd take a bit. I would teach it uh, yeah. eventually. Um, and uh, but not until they have a good prerequisite strength yeah. and stability. Well, yeah, just, but don't just, you, just don't... because of that fact is it's now we're moving it fast. Anything time we're moving it fast, like as long as you have the stabilization and in, in the proper uh, mechanics involved. Like, I think that's the next level to progress. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The the way that I like to do barbell, if I had to pick one, because I do them all, is a pronated, which is overhead and grip. And I don't go, you know, flat to the floor, which believe it or not, a traditional barbell row, you're supposed to be, you know, horizontal to the floor. So your back is literally flat. That's a traditional row. I like to do it where my upper body's more at a 45 degree yeah. angle. And this mm -hmm. is the way that like Dorian Yates used to barbell row back in the nineties. And he, he made the exercise real popular because everybody loved how big his back was or whatever. I feel it more that way. Now, when I bend all the way over, yeah. obviously you can't use as much weight. I feel a little bit more in the upper back and less of the lats. So I'll do that 45 degree angle one. And that's usually how I'll, do my rows. Yeah, I've noticed version. when you row, I row more almost all the way yeah. over. Yeah, I just, I feel like I get a lot of lower back involved in there because the erector spinae has sure. to stabilize in that position. And so I feel like a, I feel like a better overall back workout the further I'm bent over. But you're right, you can't row very much, you know. No. Yeah. But that's where the pen leg comes in. Like if you mm -hmm. can do a pretty good, you know, I don't know, 225, let's say, of a bent over row all the way over, then you could shoot shooting up 275 plus with the pen lay if you can right. hold that position that that whole time. So I kind of get both that way. Yeah, or if your lower back is, uh, you know, feeling it quite a bit and, and is a bit fried, I like to lean over the bench and get that kind of stabilized support so that way I can lift a bit heavier too if it's been taxing. Like I did deadlifts, you know, previous to that but yeah i think they're all valid well and this is just a great way of just this is how you would they all belong in your arsenal i think and i think you can just uh, maybe except for pen lay right because it's an explosive movement yeah. that's the only one that you know you bring up the point that you should have pretty good mechanics with your other other row exercises before you even consider doing pen lay but mm -hmm. if you have really good row form uh, then doing this explosive movement i think is yeah. is totally fine if for you do a row like a good row, barbell row, I'd say probably one of the better ones or dumbbell row, and a pull-up, you're hitting almost everything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the pull-up, chin-up, or pull-down, I, I prefer the chin-up. That's really lat heavy. When you're doing the row, you're getting more of that mid-back than you would with a pull-up, and I think you develop a really nice balanced back. When you, And of course, you throw deadlifts in, and you're pretty much covered uh, with the whole deal. Very but I, I remember specifically, there was a guy that worked out at, uh, golds years ago. This is a golds I used to go to. And he was like a pull-up machine. That's actually all he did was a, a million and one different variations of pull-ups. And he had these very well-developed lats, but very weak mid-back and upper mm. back development. And you could tell mm -hmm. all he did were pull-ups. So there's in order to develop balance, especially in such a large musculature, because we say the back, it's you know, you know, the back consists of a lot of muscles. Yeah. We pretend like it's one muscle. There's so many muscles. You want to do rows, you want to do pull downs, you want scapular retraction, you want to do some kind of scapular elevation, 
you want to do all this stuff to develop all the different you know muscles of that of that area. Well, and to answer the question, which is which one is better for building the back, it's and I think you guys would agree, it's the one that you're doing the least out of these, right? Mm -hmm. So if, get good at one of them that you suck at. Yeah. For sure. So the one that you never do is going to end up developing the back the most because the other ones your body is somewhat adapted to doing that. So. I think they all belong in the rotation, and the best one that you should probably be doing right now is the one that you either never do or rarely do. Next question is from Yihan. What is the difference between mobility and flexibility? What a great question. Yeah. Good question you picked, Justin. Yeah. So in, in the way that we use mobility, because I think some people define mobility different, but the way we use mobility is you have control and strength within a particular range of motion. So that's your mobility. Flexibility is just range of motion. So like to give you an example, my 11 month year old son has got incredible flexibility. I mean, I could take his feet, I can put them by his head, he could do the splits. He's like, but he has no strength in there. So he's very unstable. I mean, my son can barely hold his own body up. If I put load on him, he'd probably hurt himself. So that's not the kind of, that's not what you want. You don't want to just be flexible. In fact, although not common, I've trained people with tremendous flexibility who have very little strength. They're the most injury risk uh, uh, people that I've ever worked with. They're super injury prone because they've got such crazy ranges of motion with no strength, and, and that's how you hurt yourself. Mobility is range of motion with strength. So mm -hmm. it's the difference between you know, sitting on the floor in the splits and getting into the splits, but you can do it with resistance on your body or jump out of it without having to support yourself. Right. Like you own that range of motion. So I've trained a few clients like this and they all did have something in common. All of them were like yogis. Yeah. So I don't know if you guys, if you guys have trained enough people to see if there's like a common theme, but the clients that I had that had incredible flexibility, but lacked good mobility, right? So strength and stability in that range of motion were like people that just loved yoga. They didn't do any real strength training. They just did yoga all the time. And so they were sitting in static stretches all the time. So that was the most common thing that I saw. I didn't have anybody else like that. You know that. what's funny about that, Adam, is because same here. So I, I can think of three people off the top of my head. Two people were yoga fanatics. One person actually was not active at all. And she just genetically was super, super hyper flexible. But when you look, when you actually go, because then I took yoga classes and, you know, Jessica was yoga certified and her instructor was incredible. And I brought this up to them and I said, I noticed when I've trained people who are yoga fanatics, they had terrible stability in mm -hmm. certain ranges of motion. And they said, that's because they're not practicing yoga properly. When you do yoga properly, you're supposed to stay active in the poses. So like, let's say you're in like warrior one, mm -hmm. you're not supposed to allow your feet to press out against the mat and just kind of sit. You're supposed to pull them in and stay active and activate your muscles. You're not just supposed to sit on the joint. You yes. Know, and let your body weight kind of yeah. rest. Now, now yin yoga would do that, right? You're sitting in a stretch and you're just relaxing and letting the things yeah. get loose, which I could see some benefit for someone like me who's maybe really tight, but yeah, that'll make you... That'll increase your risk of injury if you don't have the strength. But yeah, speaking of like the hypo, uh, hyper flexible clients, like I had a few of those, and all we would do is work on mobility. And, yeah. and that being the difference where we would take certain positions and poses and uh, try to gain access to those those positions and poses by flexing and contracting muscles through so like isometrics. So you get isometric contraction first, uh, just to be able to now gain that kind of communication and then try to slowly move our way out of those positions as well. So yeah, you, you want to, you want a good range of motion that you, and, but you have to own it. Otherwise it doesn't mean anything. I mean, think of being in a long static stretch. Now imagine your three-year-old jumps on you. If you feel like that would, tear something, you don't own that range of motion. Yeah. The range of motion you should that you have, you should have control over. I mean, this how injuries happen typically is someone moves in a range of motion, either quickly or whatever, that they don't own. So it's like, oh my God, I bent over and twisted to grab a box and I pulled my back muscle. It's because you moved outside of the range of motion that you fully owned. And when that happens, things become unstable and you end up injuring yourself. So mobility is what you want flexibility can lead to mobility. So you, you might want to increase range of motion, but if you don't connect to it, then it's, it's not really helping you. You have to have that control. Next question is from Lockie Maloney. When is the best time to train the core and how often? Uh, you know, that's actually not a bad question because I don't think it's a good idea if you're doing a multiple body part workout or a full body workout to train your core 
before you train everything yeah, else. Well, you don't want to fatigue cool. the core yeah. and then go into heavy backloaded squats or deadlifts, right? Yeah. That would not be ideal. It's so involved in everything that training your core first mm -hmm. just is going to increase your instability. It's not a good idea. Yeah, your okay. last line of defense, right? Yeah. Like That's what's keeping uh, your spine, everything intact and in good alignment while now you can add stresses, external stresses on top of that. So you want that nice and fresh and not fatigued. But at the same time, too, in terms of like training it, like frequency of training it is a good idea is something that you want to make sure like you do have a strong core and it's like finding its way repeatedly in your programming. Well, that's that's why I, I program it either at the end of a workout or on a separate day. Yes, uh -huh. because what you don't want is and it's not that you couldn't do it at the beginning of the workout or in the middle of the workout. It's like I just you don't want to fatigue that muscle. Uh, doing something that is heavy loaded. Uh, probably not that big of a deal if you're training more hypertrophy or endurance type training where it's high reps and you're never really loading the bar that much. Probably not that big of a deal if you were to train core in the beginning or the middle. But definitely if I'm in the middle of a strength phase, um, the last thing that you want to be fatigued is your core when you're you know, loading the barbell up. It's just dangerous to do that. And it doesn't make any sense. Not to mention, you're going to get some good core work while you do that. I mean, when you mm -hmm. brace your core for a heavy backloaded squat or a deadlift, you are training your core. So I wouldn't want to do anything like lots of reps or fatiguing until the end of the workout. Yeah, the best results I ever got with core would be a little bit of exercise, a little bit of core work at the end of every workout. So at the very end, I do something. Thing. And then a couple days a week that's just uh, core related. And usually what it would look like would be some kind of a carry or some kind of a functional core movement to start with. Mm -hmm. I like suitcase carries or overhead carries or windmills. Windmills are actually really good mm -hmm. for stabilization. A little bit of counter rotation or rotation. So a cable chop or one where your hands are close at your sides and then you press out in front of you, so you're just increasing the tension but maintaining stability. Yeah. And then finish off with direct core work like your reverse you know, crunches or your slow sit-ups and stuff like that. And I got incredible results that way. But yeah, yeah I, I would say you probably definitely don't want to work your core before you do anything that involves yeah. any compound lift because uh, if your core fatigues faster than the rest of your body, and your form breaks down because your core is weak, the risk of injury is really high. Well, and to like uh, definitely the same kind of formula where it was like at the end of the workout of my heavy days and like just a little bit, but uh, the days in between, like that's my opportunity now to really express this um, twisting and rotating and anti-rotating type of movements that uh, it's really hard to program those otherwise, mm -hmm. uh, which provides so much value because now too, like your body will just respond when you get in a pinch, when you get in a, a, a non sort of robotic, uh, you know, isolated type of a movement, which is pretty much everyday life. Uh, you know, you're going to have some kind of like micro rotation or something happen where you got to stabilize and adjust. Uh, and to be able to keep that you know, regular in your routine is going to keep you, uh, keep your longevity going even further. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I, when I really realized the importance of core strength and stability, cause you learn this right as a trainer, I always talk about it, it becomes a sales pitch when you, when you're talking about your training and how much the core is important, all that stuff. But I remember when I would train, uh, athletes who hired me to augment their training, I trained some triathletes, I've trained some marathon runners and Ironman competitors. And because of their, the style of their, their training for their sport, they're constantly doing something. They're running or they're cycling or they're swimming. And my resistance training was always like a once or twice a week type of thing just to maintain strength and, you know, prevent muscle loss and, and prevent injury. And I'll never forget, and this happened, this was true for all of them. If I trained their core really hard, they could not do anything else for the rest of the day. Like I could train their legs. I could hammer their upper body. Mm -hmm. They could go cycle, swim, no problem. If we beat up their core... They couldn't do any of that stuff. And they would always come back and be like, yeah, I could, I cycled afterwards or I ran after, and my back bothered me. So yeah. we can't do core except for at the end of the day when I've done everything. And I remember that. I was like all, like every single one of them was the same thing. If we did core, it had to be after they did everything else or by itself. Otherwise it would, you know, impede their performance. Next question is from Colton Marshall. 
What supplements should not be taken together? Oh, mm. I, I, I figured Sal would know this yeah, one. Yeah, uh, D-ball and Cessanon probably. <laughs> so much. That's, that's, those are probably a little much yeah. together. Yeah, no. like, like what magical formula you put out together in like, that? Oh, that's a great reaction. stack. That's actually, great. Yeah. That puts on both sides. <laughs> you know what? Okay, so I know the question is like basically do they negate, like what supplements negate each other's effects? Well, okay, I'll start with that. If you're taking an amino acid – specifically to, let's say, increase nitric oxide, right? Then you probably don't want to take it with protein or with a lot of amino acids because now it kind of loses its effect. So like if I take citrulline, for example, by itself pre-workout to boost nitric oxide, but I take it citrulline and protein powder, now I've got all these amino acids. A lot of them are competing and it's not going to produce uh, you know, those kind of effects. Wouldn't you say the same thing goes for if you're taking a protein powder and then a branched chain amino acid? W- waste the time unless your protein intake is low, in which case spiking branched chain, uh, branch chain amino acids makes sense. But yeah, I think generally speaking, branched chain amino acids are uh, a waste of money. Again, unless your protein intake is below that, that high amount. Uh, now, here's what you really should pay attention to. And this is, what I, this is the lesson that I've learned uh, probably a handful of times. What you don't want to do is combine supplements that augment each other because sometimes one plus one equals five. And what I mean by that is like if I combine caffeine and caffeine, like if I take 100 milligrams of caffeine, 100 milligrams of caffeine, then the effect I'm going to get is 200 milligrams of caffeine. That doesn't always work with stimulants. Sometimes you take 100 milligrams of caffeine and a little bit of ephedra or yohimbi or siniferin. And it's not like that. They amplify each other and you get this kind of dangerous runaway, you know, stimulant effect. So that would be the big thing I would say pay attention to. Don't combine stimulants unless you really know what you're doing because the additive effects can be kind of nasty and a bit, uh, you know, dangerous. What about some of these supplements that are labeled as a fat burner and then a muscle builder? Oh, I hear what you're saying. Right. At the same Which time, is, I imagine or, or that's more a fat burner on a calorie surplus. Right. I, I just Im- I imagine that that's where this question is probably coming from. I, I doubt it's down to the uh, individual chemical level where you're going, and it's probably more generic. Like, could I take a muscle builder supplement and a fat loss supplement at the same time? That seems like right. a more common question that you would it, hear. Yeah. What's funny about that is that their muscle builder fat loss supplements do they compete with each other? Not really. Uh, but your diet and your training are what make the biggest difference. You take all the fat burners you want. You're in a calorie surplus. It's it's a complete uh, waste of time. You know, the thing that's really interesting- The same thing goes for a muscle builder. You could be taking all the muscle builder supplements you want, but if you're in a caloric deficit, you're going to have a hell of a time trying to build muscle. Totally. It's going to happen. You know what, what, uh, what this makes me think of is, and this is the supplement industry is really good at this, is- and they still do this. They'll be like a, a supplement that's like for the pump or for muscle building or for libido or for sleep. And you'll turn around the label and it has everything you've ever read about that's supposed to help for that particular yeah. thing. And you'll look at it and be like, oh, this is for sleep. And they would be like, tryptophan, melatonin, theanine, GABA. And you're like, oh, this has everything. That yeah. means it must be more effective. What typically, what, What's typically happening there is that none of those things have efficacious doses. They just have a tiny bit of everything in there to get, or they'll have efficacious dose of one thing, like three milligrams of melatonin and everything else is like this tiny amount. Yeah. So, you know, what you want to do is you want to look at efficacious doses, uh, the right form. And then that's the thing you pay attention to, not just whether or not it's listed. Like I remember in the nineties, there was a supplement called hot stuff. And <laughs> it it was popular because because that niacin baby, probably loaded in it, and so that made you sweat your balls off. It, so you thought it was working hella it, good. It said on it, it had everything in it. I remember that. That was like super. That was like one of those yeah. hacks, right? They would they would load it up with niacin, and then everything else was pixie dust. And but you thought it worked because you're like, oh my like, god, my I'm skin's just, red. Yeah, I'm just I'm sitting sweating. here, and my armpits are sweating right now. I've yeah. even done anything. This stuff is really working. Yeah, well, the kicker with supplements pre workout, uh, the pre workout space figured this out. Is if we could put something in there, the person can feel, yeah. even if it doesn't do anything for the goal, as long as they could feel yeah. it, we're gonna sell a lot. So beta alanine, although there's some benefit, it makes your skin tingle, so that kind of makes yeah. you feel like it's I'm working. itchy. Something's working. By the way, you know they, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they borrowed that from other markets like toothpaste and shampoo. And oh, definitely shampoo. I mean, all those like dandruff commercials, like I the could tingle, tingle. Let you know it's working. Yeah, yeah or like, you know the the, the, the fact that your you know what's crazy is up. I'm aware of that and it still works on me. 
Of course. Yeah. Like I still, I want my toothpaste to foam up. I want my head to feel tingly where I used to want my head to feel tingly. <laughs> when I wash my hair. Not so yeah. much anymore. Wash but I, I, it's even though I know that I know the science behind it, that that's all, that is all for them to make, just to make you feel like it's working. And it's more effective, yeah. but how crazy the psychology of that it's, I know it. And yet I still want it. Dude, I still would you want, want the lesson still works for me. You oh know, gosh. Like, oh, it's great. Would you want to use soap that didn't lather? Like what if it just like was slick right. and then you rinse your hands? Right, off? and that's a, that's another example. Which, by the way, when you do some of this like organic, all natural soap, you'll notice yeah. it doesn't lather up the same, and so you feel like you're like, God, I've been scrubbing my arm for like three minutes now. It's not lathering up. You know what's a good? I'll tell you what are good, good, interesting combinations. Uh, here's a good, a classic example. Theanine is an amino acid that's been shown to cause a calming effect in the body. Right? Caffeine is a stimulant. I love now, that together when you introduce that. Well, now you you think to yourself. Well, that would be counteracting. And, but what happens is the theanine actually reduces the negative effects of caffeine, but doesn't take away the energy producing effects. So what you get from it is this really smooth, you know, focus that just yeah. feels it's like really the good. high L without less the jitter. jittery. Yeah. yeah. Yes. You could do this with ashwagandha does that really well with caffeine where you get this nice, smooth energy. Some supplement companies seem to be jumping on this, kind of figuring this out. But yeah, you don't want to, again, when you stack supplements that all do the same thing, Sometimes you get more the negative and not more of the positive. So that's what I'd say. And the, and the, I think the biggest takeaway is the nutrition piece, right? Like, because most people that are probably asking this question, I think, go back to the fat loss muscle building thing. And the thing that's going to make the biggest difference on whether the it's the supplement is effective is actually where you're at calorically. Because if you're taking a supplement to build muscle, but you're constantly in a caloric deficit, you're not going to build any muscle. The same thing goes for what Justin was saying about the fat burning. If your goal is to take fat burner supplements, but you're eating in a 500 or do a thousand calorie surplus every day, that supplement is going to burn any it's fat. It's not doing anything. Yeah. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our free guides. We have guides that can help you build muscle or burn body fat or even just improve your health. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at mindpumpsal. And Adam is at mindpumpadam. Adam. 